Hi, good evening. Welcome to Live with Dawn Butler. And joining me on the sofa this week, I've got Natalie Sadaka, a young legal aid lawyer or solicitor from London. And so if you want to catch the show, you can catch it live stream on www.smcorp.tv. If you're tweeting in today at Star Media Corp, at Dawn Butler Brent, hashtag Live with Dawn Butler, tweet in your comments and questions. And if you're on Facebook, it's uh, forward slash Star Media Corporation. And if you want to call in live in the studio today, it's 0203 395 2095. Hi, Natalie. Good evening. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks so, for inviting me on. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for coming in. So you're um, a young legal aid solicitor. Uh, tell me, what is legal aid? Well, legal aid is basically a service to ensure access to justice or historically was a service to, to ensure that for the people who need it most. And I mean, it, it's something that people often know a bit about, but we tend to take for granted. So, I mean, thinking about legal aid, it's, it's worth putting it in the context a bit of, of where it comes from, similar to kind of the, the National Health Service and um, a lot of what, what we see as the modern welfare state actually started after the after the second world war when people were asking for sort of universal services for everyone and um the idea is fundamentally it's it's a public service it's you know about saying whether someone's rich or poor they deserve access to justice and it it no it wasn't really supposed to be just a service for for the very poorest people it was similar to how the the national health service is now the idea was that everyone um, you know should should be able to use it but even people who weren't the poorest would you know it would be a good enough quality service that people would want to use it um, the picture now is is a bit different but you know legal aid has covered many areas of, of law and um, a lot of people will know it in in criminal in the criminal context if you're charged with a criminal offense may be wrongly charged with a criminal offense and you need someone to represent you um, but it can also be relevant for, for family disputes um, housing and up till recently for, for lots of other areas like welfare benefits and deaths as well because it's I mean <clears throat> it's important isn't it that everybody has um, fair access to justice mm. it's it's the cornerstone of our democracy so you know otherwise it means that certain people will get away with certain things and other people will not so um, how do the, how are the cuts affecting that access to justice well they're they're affecting it quite seriously and that is a really important point that you know if if, if everyone's supposed to be equal before the law mm. that that doesn't work unless people have at least you know, fairly equal representation. So, where does that saying come from that everybody's equal in the eyes of the law? Well, I think that's. It doesn't necessarily have a, you know, a first starting point. It's not a quote, as far as I know, from a from a particular person. It's more just a, a kind of a part of the. A legal I, system. Yeah, and and yeah. the idea of of living in a in a democracy rather than you know, the old feudal system that we used to have where you had the lord of the manor and, and mm. they had, you know, completely different legal rights to, mm. to normal people. Mm. Um, that's, in theory, that should not be the case in, you know, in, in modern Britain. Um, but if, if you have a situation where, and, and not rights aren't only enforced in the courts, there's lots of other ways that people can enforce their rights, of mm. course, but if, if you do have a, a situation where it breaks down and the only way that you can, say for example, you're in a family dispute mm. um, and you've got a man and a woman who have broken up and they're, they're, they're fighting over custody of their children and perhaps there's domestic violence involved, um, of course it's best if they can sort that dispute out without going to court, but in some situations that won't always work. If one of them is in court and is able to pay the best lawyer to, f to prepare their case, to fight their corner, who knows exactly how the law works, and the other one can't afford it and, and can't afford a lawyer at all, and there's nothing else, there's no, you know, there's no other representation available to them, how, how can we possibly say those, people, those two people are, are equal? 
that one of them is having to fight their own corner and represent themselves without specialist knowledge and it's not you know they might be they might be perfectly intelligent and good at representing themselves but it's not the same as as having someone who specializes in that area so in, in all those in all those kind of situations the person who who, ha who has representation will be unfairly privileged and the whole idea of, of having legal aid was that you'd have lawyers who okay you know might be paid a bit less than private lawyers but would be there would be enough resources available that they could do a decent job of, of representing their clients and, and ensuring that those who couldn't pay for a lawyer would would also be able to yeah. enforce their rights yeah. I think it's such a powerful point and and the fact is that you're saying that you know, the cuts now in legal aid means that there's going to be a reduced service. So people are going to have um, less uh, avenues or ways of pursuing their their legal courts and stuff. And I, and I also know you do some stuff with the police as well, which I'm going to touch on a little mm. bit later on. But tell me about some of the new things that are coming in, like the residency test and stuff. How does, how does that affect sort of legal aid and, and all the changes to benefits, um, whereas people had some rights where they could maybe get preparation in questioning if they feel that they want to appeal against you know some benefit sanctions now that's kind of been taken away how does it you know how does it work mm. is, is it justified do you think it's justified because they say that well you know we spend x million pounds and they want to make 360 million pounds worth of cuts and you know the, the, we've got this deficit um and we're in austerity so we have to cut somewhere do you think it's justified I've asked you a lot mm, of questions. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm going to take them in reverse order, mm. I think. So the first mm. thing is, 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 it, is it justified? I mean, I, I don't think it is, but in my, in my view, it's, it's not just about legal aid. It's, you know, it's austerity more generally. I, I don't believe it is justified. I think that, you know, that there has been, there have been cuts in corporation tax, th things haven't really genuinely got more difficult for the richest people in society and, and the cuts are, are being made in a way that affect the, the poorest and most vulnerable people and, and ordinary working people and, and that's, a, that's a problem and I don't, think the, I don't think the austerity argument really works. Um, then with legal aid more specifically, we've, we've, we've heard the argument for a long time even before the austerity drive about we spend this amount every year on, on legal aid and it's more than every all the other European countries. It's actually a, a quite a misleading argument because we have a particular legal system in this country where it, it's adversarial, which means that you, you go into court and you've got two people, one on either side, and they're kind of having a, an argument in mm. effect. Um, on the continent, in, in a lot of continental legal systems, they have an inquisitorial system. So the judge actually has resources to go and investigate the cases um, and, and plays quite a different role. Um, so if you look at the case, if, if you look at the overall spend when you add in the resources put into the court systems, it, it's not, it doesn't tend to be that different. You're right, that's never really discussed no. or talked about in, in that way. So you've really kind of, um, opened my eyes there <laughs> to how the system works as well. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think that it, uh, there, there are various other points like that as well, because for example, it's talked about in terms of making savings, but there's been no s sort of suggestion that there sh should be any cuts to the, uh, the fees that are paid to in the, the lawyers that work for the government. So mm. the lawyers that are often on the other side of cases that legal aid lawyers will bring in effect it's it's the same it's the same job um you so know the government pay their own in-house lawyers mm. um and their rates haven't changed no. but the lawyers for legal aid their rates have changed yeah but rates how have does, changed why does the government or? have in-house lawyers well i mean i don't think there's anything wrong with, with having in-house lawyers in in itself um i mean it, they may they may use outside lawyers for some points they might mm. may use in-house lawyers for, for others i I don't. I don't think there's an issue with that in particular. I just think it's interesting that there's really no scrutiny on on the on the levels, you know, the levels of income that they're able to to charge directly to the government, um, whereas there's this constant squeeze on on you know on people who are on the on the other side of it. Mm. Um, 
But going on to the, the question about welfare benefits, so that, mm. that's one area that was taken out of what we call out of scope of legal aid in, in April of last year. Mm. Um, what, what that means is basically le legal aid is generally not available for, for, for representation at, at welfare benefits tribunals. And that's a huge issue because, I mean, th it comes at the same time as well as a lot of changes to welfare benefits that can be quite confusing. And one that people will be quite quite familiar with is what's been sort of nicknamed the bedroom tax, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. is basically a you know a tax on if if your if your property is seen as being under occupied, and it's. It's a big problem because, for example, you might you might be facing homelessness because you can't pay your rent, and you might still, you know, as as it stands, be able to get a legal aid lawyer, a housing lawyer, to come and help you challenge the the decision to evict you from your home. But if there's this gap between your benefits and the and the amount of rent you're being charged every week, that that that's going to build up mm -hmm. and build up and build up and there's now it's now much more difficult to get the access to kind of tackle that root of the problem as it as in you know people not not actually having enough benefits to cover their own housing costs or other basic mm. um day-to-day so -day needs so last year they would have been able to get help to maybe tackle it if they feel that they've been unfairly treated but this year that they're, they're unable to get help yeah because i mean and I, i'm not by any means a welfare benefits expert but yeah. the <coughs> the criteria for say a cut to benefit could potentially be be applied wrongly by mm. say the local authority or the the dwp whoever is making that decision on the benefits um, but often they, those are not straightforward and, and we'll need someone to, to look at them and you know, mm. potentially go all, all the way to a tribunal. And, and mm. before, yes, there would have been um, representation available. And I mean, when I've spoken to people who've done that kind of work, they'd say that actually it's quite, you know, you often win in the tribunals. Often mm. the decisions are made wrongly the first time. Mm. But again, it's something where you know, people can people can be perfectly intelligent and able, but yeah. they just might find it quite difficult to to challenge that themselves without uh -huh. without someone to to give them help with it. So previously that would have been available, and and now it's not, and that comes at the same time as you know the 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 welfare benefits tightening yeah. up a lot. So right. it, it's so lots of people will have. Mm. Like, I almost think it's orchestrated because lots of people are obviously going to have lots of problems mm. and issues with the changes to the benefits. And then you've got all the legal aid cuts that come in at the same time. Yeah. So before we go to the break, um, just tell me, um, what's the uh, residency test? The residence test is one of the proposals that came in. It's not been implemented yet. So shortly after all the, the first round of changes were brought in um, that they it, they brought out a new consultation paper called transforming legal aid and one of the one of the suggestions in it was a residence test and what that means is that broadly speaking for civil legal aid so so not criminal but all the other areas of legal aid it will only be available to people who have been in the UK for 12 months and are what's called lawfully resident and that is an issue for, for lots of different reasons. Mm. Um, one, one of them is, is the practicality of it. I mean, you know, as a solicitor myself, I'm not an immigration specialist. I, it, it, it's difficult to say that as part of your role, you, you're supposed to be checking people's immigration statuses. Wow. Um, but it's <coughs> also, I think, fundamentally discriminatory to say that, you know, for example, if, if you're here and you're I mean, if you're in immigration detention, you you would have, you would still be able to get legal aid to challenge your detention. But if, say, something happens to you when you're in detention, and you want to bring a claim arising from that, it, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to bring that. Um, so we're hearing, for instance, some of the women that are held in detention centres are sexually abused. Mm and they would not be allowed to bring any claims against their abuser. Well, they, they wouldn't have funding, yeah. And yeah. that, I mean, that is one of the key, that's one of the key points and, and the, the key issues because I think that refers to Harmonsworth Detention Centre and there's a number of women who are bringing claims and it, it's very, very serious allegations of sexual assault and, you know, in a sense, 
misfeasance in, in public or people really abusing their positions of power um, in, in relation to very vulnerable women. Mm. And that's exactly the sort of claim that, you know, that's a civil claim mm. and, and, it, and it wouldn't be funded anymore. And although there is a, a sort of um, a procedure called exceptional funding, which is supposed to be a safety net for those kind of cases, the reality is that a, a tiny handful of, of those applications have been granted and it's such a difficult process that it, it's almost verging on impossible. So wow. mo most of those types of claims would, would not be would not be brought and and it's you know it it's really part of a, a kind of idea of creating an underclass of people that don't have the same rights mm -hmm. and i think it's one of the one of the things that it hasn't been brought in yet and it probably will be brought in shortly but it's a really important mm -hmm. thing to be taken up by you know yeah. um not just by lawyers but but by groups who are working with immigrants and representing immigrants because yeah. And and I know we've only got like two minutes, but um, so if somebody comes to see you and they want some help, you then have to question whether they have a legal right to stay in the country before mm. they'd get legal aid. And if they just say to you, "Yes, I've got legal aid," are you? Can you take them as their word, or, or are you? expected to get some kind of um, confirmation? Well, n no, that's the problem. You would have to get confirmation. And what would that look like? What would the confirmation look like? Well, it's, that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the problem, really, because it's, it's going to be very difficult in a lot of cases. I mean, if someone is a British citizen, they may have a passport, but actually, if you're, if you're a poorer British citizen, you don't necessarily have mm. a passport. You don't necessarily travel. It costs fifty pounds to get mm. one or, or more. Um, but you know, people whose immigration status is more complicated because they are, you know, they have come to the country more recently, and perhaps they're going through um, asylum procedures, mm. or they've gone through them, but they haven't got citizenship yet. It, it's going to be very, very difficult, and this has been raised with the government in response to consultations, and and they've sort of said, well, it doesn't really matter because if if you do the work and then they turn out not to be eligible, there won't be any sanction. But in fact, that means that you could you wouldn't get paid. you would you wouldn't get paid, wow. which I mean wow. is. It's not all about yeah, getting paid, yeah, but, but I mean, you yeah. can't, you can't, um, we, we don't have charitable funding. Yeah. We're only paid for the work that's that we do. That's almost so. like saying, well, you need to make sure that that's th that person, mm. that's why otherwise they're not going to get paid. Mm. Talk about stop and search at the moment. Mm. It's, it's, it's very um, high on the agenda at mm. the moment. And there's talk about uh, limiting the police powers to stop and search. Um, what do you think about that? I, I think it's very important that each use of stop and search is, is fully justified and I think that's what's missing at the moment. Um, there was quite an interesting report that came out last year by a, a body called Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and, and you, you can probably tell from their name they're not a particularly <laughs> radical campaigning body. Yeah. They're, they're a, you know, they're a government, mm. not, not directly part of the government but they're a body that's there to inspect the constabularies. Mm. And they were actually very critical of the way that the stop and search powers were being used. For example, in most cases of stop and search, apart from in limited exceptions, the, the police are supposed to have reasonable grounds mm. to suspect that that individual is carrying prohibited articles, so, you know, stolen items or drugs mm. or weapons and so on. And, and in many of the many, many cases, that that there just isn't enough. The, the suspicion will be just based on the person being young or being in, in, in a high crime area. And I think that there needs to be a much, that there needs to be a much greater level of scrutiny. And, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite sad to see that, you know, in certain areas of London, you will, you, you can speak to young people, often young, young boys, um, perhaps more than young girls who it's just a almost daily part of their life that they're you know they, they're going around their business they're going to school they're going to see their friends and they're being stopped and searched all the time mm. without yeah. without there being a real reason yeah, for reason that to for happen it. so we've got a caller on the line um good evening welcome to the show hello and uh, my name is Syed. hi Fred. 
And I would like to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Um, it's to do with the uh, uh, divorce system. And a lot of the community is actually, they're not technically married through the registry. Um, they either marry through the mosque. Is In regard to that, what is the legal system in getting divorced if they're receiving... Um, if they're receiving job seekers allowance or uh, benefit. Okay, I think that that's quite a um, a specialist question really, Um, but my understanding is that normally what happens is after that ceremony, it's normally ratified in a registry office. So if you don't ratify the marriage in a registry office, then it's not, um, it's not legally uh, bound here in the UK under UK laws of getting married. Um, so, and in regards to job seekers allowance, etc., then um, I think it's that's now changed in terms of how it's um, paid. It's normally now paid to one person, one dedicated person. You have to dedicate a person to who that's paid to. And so, you'd need to really, I think, seek some. I don't know if um, Natalie's got anything else to add on that. It's not really okay. something that I could tell you more about because I'm not, not a family lawyer, but it sounds, what, what Dawn has said sounds like sounds likely to be right, but it may be something that you want to speak to, say, a Sisters Advice Bureau about that yeah. kind of issue. I think, yeah, you need to go and, and sort of definitely seek further, further help um, and advice on that. Um, but thank Where you very much. Uh, sorry? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for calling in. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. Maybe we'll maybe we need to do another show around <laughs> yeah. around that issue because lots of people yeah, do get married and they don't sort of have it legally sort of ratified mm. in the country. Um, so you were talking about stop and search and policing and how successful are you in bringing cases to the police? Because it, it's very difficult um, to do, isn't it? Yeah, it is difficult, but we we often bring the case i mean smaller cases or or cases where it's 50 50 Mm. often you know you you might not be that successful in them but i mean a lot of the cases that that we work on are are cases where where you know something has gone badly wrong Mm. so you know we we do have we do have quite a reasonable success rate um because we we sort of look for the cases that I mean uh, bringing a claim against the police is a very sort of it's a very drawn out process Mm -hmm. it takes a very (laughs) long time and it's quite you know if we we even take the case with um, Mitchell Mitchell MP Mm. um, and the Plebgate saga I mean that took over 12 months and you know you you know you think what a waste of time and money really but uh, in my opinion, um, but um, but that took over to, and that's somebody high profile that's got all the weight mm. of the government and all the resources behind him. So just for an ordinary person on the street that's been stopped and searched and roughly handled by the police, how do they do it? Mm, I mean, uh, in in a if it's just a question of a stop and an individual stop and search, that's often a case that. You could you could bring an individual complaint about it, but it's whether it's going to be worth bringing a claim um, is is debatable because it, it you know although it's obviously very wrong to be wrongly stopped and searched, it's a question of how much damage has actually been done. But what I mean, what I could give an example of how that situation might turn into a situation where there would be a claim mm. is if, for example the person says something to the officers about their rights that the officers think is rude and the officers then in a, a group of officers perhaps attacks the person and in the in the process of that the officers write statements to say that the person has attacked them and as a result perhaps the person has injuries perhaps they spend the night in custody perhaps they're prosecuted for that and they have to go all the way to the magistrate's court and defend themselves and, and it's only there or maybe only on an appeal um, that that they 
that they're actually exonerated and, and, and it's shown that, that they're not the one to have done something wrong. That's the kind of case where you might say it is worth spending the time, it is worth going through that process because they've lost so much. They you know, they they've they perhaps they've had injuries, perhaps mm. they, they've There's been affected psychologically. Threshold really when you think about it. I mean it's you say it's a lot, they've been through so much, mm. but it is it is a high threshold. Well, I, I'm not saying that yeah. every case has to be exactly like like that, mm. but the the kind of the kind of cases that you know tend mm. to be worth bringing and going through that whole process. But that's not to say that people shouldn't complain against yeah. the police yeah. because there's a there's a difference between bringing a whole civil claim in the courts, which you know that there's some cases you might think you don't want to spend two years bringing a claim in the courts but a complaint against the police anyone can make a complaint you know if it's the metropolitan police if, if something's gone wrong you can write to the directorate of professional standards you know you you might you might seek help from a from a lawyer if, if it's something that you need help with but if it if it's something that for example you you, you feel you can do yourself or that yeah. you you're not able to get legal aid for for, for one reason or other it, it, it's something that anyone can do and it even if it doesn't lead to the officer be, being disciplined or even if it doesn't lead to a big outcome like that it means that the concerns are being put put mm. on record you know it means that people aren't just dealing with it day in day out so mm. you know that there's different there's different ends of the spectrum there's big there's big issues and, and there's smaller issues but it's that's not mm. to say that the, that the smaller issues aren't important mm. as well yeah. so well, I mean, thank you for all the work that you do um, in the community, because if it wasn't for people like you that, you know, that still want to do sort of legal aid solicitors work and not go into <laughs> earning tons of money for probably doing less hours, you know, the, the ordinary person on the streets, uh, access to justice will be lessened even more. So, you know, we have to say a really big thank you to, to you for doing that. Um, two days ago was National uh, Registration Day where um, basically it's a date where people are encouraged to register to vote, to have their voices heard. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I think that, you know, some people will be listening and I'll just be thinking, this is crazy, you know, why, you know, how do we stop it? Mm. Why, you know, how can we allow this to happen? I mean, what do you think about people regist registering to vote and, and having their say? I mean, I think people absolutely should register to vote. I think that it, I would love to be able to say that there was a party out there that would fight for legal aid, that would fight for, you know, people on benefits, that w was going to reverse all the cuts. At the moment, I, I don't think there is. I don't think it's that straightforward. Mm. But I would say that, you know, that there is a long time until the election. And if you have certain policies that you want, now the time to push party it, to yeah. implement now now We've got a very quick call i'm going to try and squeeze in before okay. we um before we wrap up good evening caller welcome to the show good evening don uh, my name is jama hi jama and i would like to ask you a question in regard to stop and say in regards to stop and say oh yeah stop and search okay yeah i want to find out when can you take a legal action if they stop you frequently, how many times? When can you, so the time frame to, yeah, yeah what's the time frame you think? Good question, well, thank you, Julie. The, the time frame, the time limit, or how many times do they have to search you? What was the question? Well, for instance, if they stop you like, say, 10 times, 15 times. Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on whether whether they were justified, whether they had reasonable grounds to search you and whether they went through and gave you the information that they were supposed to give you, telling them who telling you who they are, telling you, you know, what what police station they're from, what power they're searching you under. Um, but if if they are if there are a large number of searches and those searches aren't justified and they, you know, potentially they are picking on someone then that that can in the right situation that can give rise to to a claim against the police yeah. and is there a time limit um so if somebody stopped somebody six months ago and they're they're still very upset about it can they take the police uh, a case against the police there there are there are various there are various time limits but i think um i wouldn't I probably wouldn't want to go into that here because it, it can be quite confusing and I would, wouldn't want to try and give 
legal mm. advice on that but what what I would say is that if you, you know if you've got something that you want to complain about then it, it's it's always best to do it as sooner soon rather possible. than later brilliant well Natalie <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for your call thank you Natalie thank you so much for coming in and joining me on the sofa this week it's been a pleasure no uh, problem Jamie, thank you and uh, thank you all the listeners and the viewers and the callers in sorry for all the calls we didn't get around to today um, but to keep it locked in and um, as I say you can watch the show again on www.smcorp.tv and I will see you again next week thank you <laughs>